Before we begin, I just wanted to offer a quick tip for success and understanding. Throughout these podcasts, I'd encourage you to download the notes pages that accompany each of them because I use my visuals as a bit of visual interest or summary of keywords. I don't script out the presentation on screen, so most of the key content doesn't appear on the screen itself. Taking notes makes sure that you're getting the information that you need. At the end of the podcast is also a list of references of the readings that support the material presented. Initially, there's been a shift in how we think about crises. We used to think about crises as low probability and high impact events that threaten the viability of organizations and were characterized by ambiguous causes, effects, and means of resolution. This very basic definition was supported by a small body of research, and essentially this is how we thought of crises for most of the last 40 years. But the problem with this definition was that both practitioners and academics recognize that crises are challenging because they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. They're often ill-structured and complex. As a result, the risks posed by modern crises, especially in information-rich environments, also vary quite substantially. So these experiences of very diverse crises demonstrate that they can affect all types of organizations. And there's an increasing recognition that organizations consistently have to deal with crises ranging from situations that are entirely out of their control to small careless mistakes to even systematic breakdowns or inefficiencies. Not surprisingly, there's been a growth of interest in responding better to crises, both from a communication as well as a general management perspective. Because we understand the complexities of crises today so much better, how we define a crisis has also evolved. So instead of thinking of crises as low probability and high impact events that are ambiguous, we should be thinking about crises differently. The best definition and explanation that I have seen comes from Heath and Millar in 2004. They define a crisis as an untimely but typically predictable event that creates risk for stakeholder interests as well as the organization's reputation. But the definition also offers hope in that when organizations respond well, they can survive and potentially thrive. However, if the organization responds poorly, it's probably not going to go well for them. Heath and Millar's definition of crisis provides us with a few important characteristics of crises, and these seem to be consistent across different types of crises in different parts of the world and with different levels of blame and severity. First, crises are inherently public in their nature. How do we know an organization is in crisis versus just dealing with a risk, problem, or issue? Simple. It's played out for us in public, whether that's purely on social media, visible in our communities, or covered extensively by the news media. So to understand crisis management, we ought to understand the nature of crisis communication. In fact, what should be clear in Heath and Millar's definition of crisis is that strategic planning around crisis and risk ought to be an inherent part of doing business in the 21st century. Second, while crises happen to or because of an organization, organizations themselves do not exist in isolation. Crises affect people, people within the organization, its community, country, and regions in which it operates. So this means that crisis management and crisis communication should always be focused on the people and groups with an interest in the organization and its activities, that is, its stakeholders. And third, the core stake at risk in a crisis is really the relationship between the organization and its stakeholders. If the relationships fail, then the outcomes of that failure can range from reputation damage to the failure of the organization and or its mission. Likewise, if the relationship is strengthened, then the organization can prosper despite the crisis and, and even sometimes because of the crisis. This definition of a crisis also suggests there are two parts to crisis response. First, of course, the material crisis response, or actually solving the problem that triggered the crisis. This can include regaining control of the situation, 
fact finding to figure out what happened so that it isn't replicated and can be solved, as well as damage control, making sure that the impact of whatever happened is mitigated and minimized as much as possible. The second part is crisis communication, which involves three equally important elements. First is the stakeholder relationship management component, and this is really looking at managing, building, or rebuilding stakeholder relationships that are damaged because of the crisis itself. Second, narrating the crisis, telling what's happened. A lot of times this will involve media engagement, but also direct stakeholder engagement across different platforms, ranging from face-to-face -to, -face to social media, so that the critical stakeholders understand your side of the story. And third, developing and implementing a communication strategy. So this is and really should be a campaign-based approach using measurable objectives, good intelligence, and continual evaluation of the effectiveness of the approach. Now, of course, these are the key points that we're going to be developing throughout the entire podcast series. Now that we have a good working definition of what a crisis is, as well as the two components of crisis response, the material and the communicative response, let's explore the past and present of crisis communication in a little bit more depth. The last 60 to 70 years has seen the field of crisis communication emerge as a cross-disciplinary field of study and to begin to coalesce into a distinctive field itself within the last decade. There are certainly noteworthy figures who have meaningfully contributed to the intellectual growth of the field and the emergence of a, a genuinely global community of scholars and scholar practitioners, and we'll talk about them throughout this podcast. Yet the growth of the field within the last 10 years suggests that we are beginning to see a diverse group of voices and perspectives emerging within the field. So I'm going to take a few minutes to highlight the developments in the field of crisis communication, but also to identify the key areas of practice and the differences in approach within them. Understanding the field's development in recent years is not just a nerdy stock check of what we do and how we do it, but it helps to understand the field's strengths and its weaknesses. So a few years ago, I had the brilliant idea to download, read, and categorize every journal article that I could find using the term crisis communication. It did seem like a good idea at the time, but I decided to do it because it seemed to me that we were becoming overly reliant on just a few journals and a few perspectives, and I knew that there was a lot more crisis-related research being published across different disciplines. When we begin to explore the field of crisis communication as a diverse and global one with a lot of different perspectives, when we ask what is crisis communication, the question is more challenging to answer because there are so many concepts and factors that influence the stakeholder relationship management process as well as how we might effectively narrate or develop and implement crisis strategy. From a global perspective, this provides us with a collection, though, of some of the most important keywords and concepts connected to crisis communication for the last 60 or 70 years. So if we answer this question, what is crisis communication, it is challenging, but that's certainly what we're going to be exploring throughout this series. While the globe word cloud gave us a good big picture of all the concepts addressed in the field, it's worth understanding how it's changed over time. There are three primary ways that the field of crisis communication has evolved over the last seven decades. First, the field is increasingly data-driven. The first wave of crisis communication focused on questions of what crisis communication is, how it fits in within the communication and management domains, and highlighted best practices in crisis communication. These are all important pieces in the field's development but they're not empirical. They're meant for reflection and conceptual growth or development. So the second wave of crisis communication research focused on the organization and its crisis response, emphasizing applied research and case studies that provided the groundwork for much of the theoretical developments in the late 1990s. But as the field has been better able to define itself, understand the nature of crisis response from the organization's perspective, the third wave has emerged, research focused on the stakeholder. 
Here, the core questions focus on stakeholder reactions to crises, crisis response, and how that can affect the organization. Yet there are some researchers that argue that the third wave is unlikely to have any real impact on practice because historically many practitioners have not made routine use of academic research on crisis communication despite it being long available. However, I would argue that the third wave has emerged in part because practitioners have challenged academic researchers to develop more conceptual models for practical application. For example, in 2016 at the International Crisis and Risk Communication Conference in Orlando, Florida, practitioners asked an academic panel why we didn't have better conceptual models to help them design and implement better response strategies. Quite honestly, we as academics didn't have a great answer to that question because the third wave of research has only just begun. But this is something that certainly motivates my research and my interest, and I know it motivates a lot of other scholars in the field. The importance of data-driven research matches the changing reality in the broader field of public relations. We see evidence of this in the Global Communications Report produced in collaboration between the British-based Holmes Report and the USC Annenberg Center for Public Relations, as well as agency-based research from global firms like Weber Shandwick and Edelman Intelligence. And we can end up drawing three conclusions about the modern realities of public relations. First, research improves strategy. Second, research demonstrates the return on investment or ROI in communication. And third, it facilitates informed decision making. As we explore the changes in crisis communication over time, it's probably good to understand the ways specifically that crisis communication research has changed. First, our conceptual interests have changed. In recent years, we've seen less of a focus on crisis management, internal communication, and crisis planning evidenced in the research that's been published. In part, this is probably attributable to the emergence of the third wave of crisis research, as well as a move away from the non-data-driven best practices pieces. We're also seeing an increasing amount of research connected to the influence of crisis, the situation, industry, social media, and emotion in crisis communication research, and it suggests really a growing trend to humanize crises, shifting away from an organizational-centric view and an understanding of crisis as one that is much more stakeholder-centered. A second change in the field of crisis communication over time has been that it has become increasingly global. When we talk about the field, the voices that have been represented have been disproportionately American, with about 60% of all empirical journal articles in the field published since 1953 researching from an American point of view. So the fact of the matter was that we had to become more global. Let me put this into perspective. 417 out of 690 journal articles focused on the U.S., this is an inconvenient truth in crisis communication. Additionally, 126 focus on Europe as a region, with most of the research in Europe focused on the UK, Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden. Further, 71 articles focus on Asia, with the overwhelming majority of these representing a Chinese viewpoint, and 21 represent Australasia, with most focusing on Australia. Finally, we find the least covered regions, the Middle East, as well as South and Central America, with six articles each, and only eight focusing on the entire continent of Africa. And this is an embarrassing reality. We know very little about crises, crisis management, and crisis communication across much of the world, especially the developing world. If the field considers voice and experience somewhat more broadly, the West's, i.e. North America and Europe voice, dominates with 80% of all articles articulating a Western voice. Though this is a weakness in the field at present, the positive side is that there has been significant change with a decrease in US-centric research, 
increasing focus in Europe, increasing focus in China, and overall a more global approach to crisis communication, we are beginning to see voices emerge from a lot of different places. It's also important to note that, you know, this isn't a grand conspiracy. It is rather a reflection of access to organizations, news, and information about crises by academics who research the field. So as our field continues to grow and change, the research itself will become more diverse and representative. Not only that, but as we're increasingly global, we'll be able to get more views from practitioners and researchers representing voices from across the world. It should be clear that the field of crisis communication will continue to develop and change over time. In as much as it's useful to have a broad overview of the field, it's also useful to understand the influence that different fields of research and practice connected to crisis communication have had. This influences the present as much as questions of culture, changing technologies and stakeholders do. Not surprisingly, much of the focus for crisis communication is connected to management and business, communication and language, and the social sciences and humanities. However, research in crisis communication is applied across most fields. Though there are commonalities that emerge when we ask the question, what themes related to crisis communication influence each of these fields, we also find that what crisis communication is will differ depending on the industry or context in which it's being applied. Medicine and health represents about 3% of the research and application in crisis communication. Here, we are more likely to see research emerging from Australasia, focusing on the particulars of crisis context and risk assessment. However, we're less likely to see an American focus or a discussion of the particular industry, interest in crisis response, or organizational assessments. The science, engineering, and technology fields represent about 6% of the research and application in crisis communication, and we're more likely to see research emerging from the Netherlands, focusing on crisis management, training and education, crisis outcomes, information management, risk, and social media. However, we're less likely to see focus on crisis response, media analysis, or assessments of the organization in crisis. In management and business, representing about 30% of the research and application of crisis communication, we're more likely to see research addressing relational factors that influence the crisis, crisis management, crisis planning, organizational assessment, stakeholder analysis, corporate social responsibility, and ethics. Yet we're also significantly less likely to see research about Africa, the crisis context, research and culture, information management, risk, or social media. In social science and the humanities, representing 31% of the research and application in crisis communication, we're significantly more likely to see an American-centric focus, an interest in crisis responses, and emotion. But we are significantly less likely to see research from European scholars with a focus on crisis management or on crisis outcomes. Communication and language represents 26% of the research and application in crisis communication. We're also significantly more likely to see an American-centric focus, an interest in crisis type, crisis response, media analyses, and emotion. But we're significantly less likely to see European-centered research or focus on crisis management, crisis planning, internal crisis management, leadership, training and education, crisis outcomes, and risk. Finally, in applied industry perspectives, representing only about 4% of the research and application in crisis communication, we are significantly more likely to see geographically diverse research with more representation of Central and South America, Australasia, and Asia. We're also significantly more likely to see direct discussions of the implications of crises on industry, crisis management, crisis planning, training and education, and risk. However, we're much less likely to see research and application directed towards crisis response, organizational assessments, and assessments of the crises themselves.
Aside from a tour of the past and present of the field, you could ask, what does it matter if we understand how crisis communication is evolving and is presently practiced? I would argue that there are three benefits to understanding the history and application of crisis communication, and this really centers on the overlapping benefit of theory and research-informed practice. First, we must read across disciplines. Now, this is as useful advice to academics who already research crisis communication as it is to the newcomer to the field. While different disciplines may have practical reasons for their focus, when we only read and cite research from within a single field, we're much more likely to have a limited and siloed view of that. That is, there's a greater risk of dogmatic attitudes about crisis communication emerging, limited application of our understanding of crisis globally, and limitations to making connections between industries and work contexts that emerge such as issues, politics, and conditions that might dictate. Second, reading broadly better prepares us for practice. If we read broadly across domains of practice connected to crisis communication, it better prepares us to understand the opportunities and limitations within fields of study and practice. For example, if we only read research and practice from communication, we would be significantly less likely to develop an understanding of the training and educational needs for crisis practitioners, and so we'd be less prepared to apply crisis theory and recommendations in a global context. Likewise, if our only exposure to crisis communication was in medicine and health, we would have a weaker understanding of the role that crisis response plays in public attitudes towards health risk. Bottom line, to be a good academic or practitioner, we need to be well read. And third, reading broadly helps us to identify better opportunities. So reading across disciplines positions us to better identify opportunities for improving research and practice within our own fields. In as much as we can be limited when we fail to read across different domains of research connected to crisis communication, being well read in the field can also allow us to more critically reflect on the state of research or practice and most importantly innovate in our own areas. For example, health campaigns have long been addressing the problems of attitude, resistance to messaging, and the impact of global pandemics to local epidemics. We can learn a lot about disaster response, for example, by understanding how health communicators have addressed difficult topics with diverse audiences from around the world. That is, all areas of practice connected to issue management, risk, and communication can learn from each other. So it's not just important to read across the domains to avoid dogmatism, but also to innovate and improve issues and crisis response in all industries and contexts.